So good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining our webinar today. This is a very special panel uh, with very esteemed faculty. This is called Lessons Learned, Adjusting Instructional Approaches. My name is David Serna, so I'll be helping facilitate from the Cal side and from the Cal team. Uh, but Peter, if you'd like to kind of introduce yourself and then everyone else introduce yourself as well. Sure. Thanks, David. I hope you guys can hear me okay. My name is uh, Dr. Peter Michael Plord. I am an associate professor of mathematics. Some people don't know that, so I love to throw it out. And uh, in addition to that, what I primarily do is direct faculty development over here at our community college campus at the lovely Bertie Bacchus. Come on over and join us if you haven't been here before. <laughs> and Peter, your sound is a little bit going in and out. Oops. Maybe maybe I'll take the, uh, the headphones off uh, for a little bit. I was trying to respect some others who may come in, but tell me if this is better in a second. We'll see how that okay. is. Okay. Is that any better? Yes. Yeah. All right, cool. Um, well, I'll say that one more time. I'm Dr. Mm -hmm. Peter Michael Florida. I am a math professor as well as a, our uh, faculty development director over here at Bertie Bacchus. I've been here just like, uh, I don't want to steal anyone's thunder, so I won't say just like, but I've been here uh, five years um, starting this year. That's it. Thank you. And who would like to go next? I'll go. <laughs> Thank you. I'm uh, Dr. Richard Salman. I am a project specialist in career and technical education, uh, working with the division directors and uh, Dean Hacker and Dean Hamilton in terms of career and technical education. Uh, like Professor Plourd, I am uh, located at the Bertie Backus facility, and I am in my fourth year at UDC. Yeah, I can go next. I'm Stella Ayika. I'm one of the faculty members in the nursing department here at uh, the Betty Backers campus as well. Um, uh, and I've been with UDC now for 10 years. And a proud graduate of UDC. <laughs> Wonderful. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, are you able to see me? I'm not able to see myself on my end. I don't see you, but I can hear you. Okay, so what I'll do is after my introduction, I'll log in and log um, log out and log back in. So hopefully okay. my camera can work. But yes, my name is Rosette Beck. I am a visiting professor for um, the community college uh, for the nursing department. And I'm actually excited to learn more about um, this product because I may try to use it tomorrow in my, in my maternity and newborn course. So thank you. I'm gonna log out and log back in, see what happens. Okay. Thank, thank you, you, Professor Beck. Thank you. And then Dr. Pearsall, if you'd like to go next. Hello, everybody. It's just Al. Uh, Al. I am. Um, <laughs> I am either the last a graduate of the last class of Federal City College wow. or the first class of UDC. I had a choice mm. uh, in, on my diploma. I decided to go with Federal City College, even though it doesn't exist, um, because it was sort of a, a unique place. So I've had a and I, and I was an adjunct shortly after getting my MBA. And I, I think I have a, a, a off and on teaching career with the university that spans like 40 years. And I think as far as being an employee of the community college, I was an adjunct, I think in 2011, I think. That was like my second stint. And then I think I got picked up for, as full-time faculty, I think in 2015, maybe, 16 or something like that. So I've got a, a long history uh, with the um, university and I've done a variety of things. And I, you know, I, I don't even really feel like, you know, I'm working even though I am. And uh, so I'm glad to be here. I'm always constantly trying to learn more about teaching methodologies and approaches. And one of the things I'd like to kind of do with community colleges, encourage us to be like a, a center of teaching excellence because we are, and like encourage more faculty, uh, regardless of your uh, discipline, to really start doing research around teaching, you know, and I think that that'll create a distinction for us with the university, uh, because you know, as you all know, that there's that chasm at the university, uh, sort of, and and I think that that's an area that we could explore uh, for research. So I'm shedding up now, but that's my two cents. <laughs> Excellent, and yeah, Professor Beck, I can also see you on camera. So hello, and Christian. Absolutely. Uh, 
Christian Aguiar. I am uh, faculty in English at the Community College with all my wonderful colleagues here. Uh, like Peter, I've been here for five years, uh, five, five good years at the Community College. Excellent. I'll ring my bell. There you go. Right. So thank you everyone for joining us this morning. This is a very special special session and I'm super happy to see all of you on this call. So uh, if you are not familiar with Mentimeter, it's a great platform to use, especially for something like this, whether it's virtual or in person. We did this session before at the community college in person, and this was a great way to have questions on the screen where everyone can see and respond to. So I'll just briefly go over the instructions for this. There are two ways you can participate today if you do want to add any questions. First one is if you do have your phone or an iPad or a tablet next to you, you can scan the QR code on the screen. So just like you were taking a picture, you scan the QR code, it will open up that link and you can open up the Q&A and ask a question. So that's one way to do that. If you prefer, you can also do this on your computer. So if you're joining this, um, if you have your computer with you, I put the link in the chat box. So if you click on that link, that will take you directly to that Q&A page where you can go ahead and put that question. So let's get started. I will put the first question on the screen. And for the panel, uh, feel free, you can go ahead and speak up. Uh, you can also take some turns, but let's look at our first question here. So the first one is, are there any virtual online hybrid best practices we can borrow from when we are teaching our on-ground classes? and or once we can continue in virtual online hybrid delivery formats. Who would like to go first? Or I can call. Uh, okay, <laughs> this, is, this is Al Pierce, so I'll throw okay. this out. Thank you. There's often a lot of debate in the virtual um, format as to whether or not students should display their image uh, mm -hmm. all the time and, and whether or not. I will tell you that in my classes, um, my, many of my students can't control their home environment. And I've actually had a situation where someone hopped in and they weren't closed. And so I had to kind of reassess that, but I, I'm lately I'm changing and I'll tell you why. I have a student that has um, signed the, the virtual class and they, they show their image, but they were shopping, they were cleaning clothes, they were doing, they were actually in a car okay, driving. Now, one could say, good, they were logged in and listening. But in reality, can you truly be engaged in a class if you're, if you're doing all other life things? And so, I, I, so what I've done is I've tried to do a hybrid. And that is, you have to show your image periodically in the class. So that means if you, if you don't control your home environment, tell your people that you're in class and that they can't just you know walk around or either tell people to be dressed or whatever. But um, that's what I'm working with so that they do have the freedom if they need to go to the bathroom or if they need to you know shut it down, they can. But at the same time, I need to know that they're actually in the class because I've had too many situations where students are logged on but they're not engaged in. So I don't know if I'm the only one that has this and I, you know, I'm trying to admit it because I'd love to let you know, I think that I'm the best instructor there is and that I don't, <laughs> that I don't, that I don't have challenges, but reality is I have challenges every semester and I have to always adapt. Thoughts people. Yes, I, I can add to that. Um, during the pandemic, I, I was breastfeeding and um, it was very interesting for me because I was the same person that wants everybody to turn their camera on. But for me, mm -hmm. there were times when I couldn't have my camera on. So I had to make the change of deciding, okay, maybe we should do the periodical one. And then I call on students because again, this thing you said, someone might not be, in, in, uh, might not be listening. I call on them periodically, different names. And that will help me to check to see if they are listening and if they are following. And you know, this Mentimeter um, activities are very helpful because then everybody has to respond and you can tell if they're not responding, that means they're not paying attention. So that's how I dealt with that. Excellent. So I'll uh, add in, for me, it's been really helpful uh, in, in all formats to think about the opportunities for asynchronous work. So I think uh, uh, Professor Pearsall and Dr. Aik are speaking to you know, some, some challenges where maybe students aren't always able to engage 
And, and I think whether we're online or hybrid or in person, asking students to be able to engage multiple times a week for a, a full 80 minutes without interruption might be asking a lot given the state the world is in right now. So I, I've really tried to incorporate some asynchronous activities where maybe every other week we say, okay, the last 30 minutes of this class is going to be uh, an activity that we're completing maybe with Jamboard or Padlet, or we're using just a discussion board on Blackboard. So we have a pause from all of that face-to-face -face interaction. And, and I find that tends to encourage students to be a little more active and present when they are in class because they know they're not gonna be required to be on 80 minutes a day all the time. So when they are required to be on, they're on. You know, yes, that's, I, yeah, I, ahead, yeah I, I wanted to, to add to what my colleagues are saying. The pandemic uh, and its aftermath, which we're still experiencing, um, caused me to rethink my own teaching practices. Uh, that plus the AQ program that I was privileged to be part of reinforced uh, some of the basic concepts that I might have, if not lost sight of, at least put in the back of my mind instead of the, the forefront. And I remembered and realized again the business that I was in. Uh, I'm not in the business of, of getting content across to students. I'm not in the business of, you know, promoting uh, specific concepts or abstract ideas. Uh, I define myself as being in the business of student success. And especially during the pandemic and afterwards, especially now, it's in the business of helping students persevere, helping students become program completers, helping students make it through the course into the next course so that they can advance in their careers. And so the focus changed in my, my teaching uh, from uh, more of content to more of relationships. And when I hear the professors talking about uh, new ways of engaging students, that's music to my ears. Uh, what I love to do is build relationships with students. And I do so even more than before by being very positive and very upbeat and very intentional in terms of I know they're going to be successful with me in our class together. It's not my class. It's not their class. It's our class. And to that end, I try as much as possible to build a learning community. And that has made a difference uh, for students in my courses. When we work together in a learning community, I mean that we are open and accepting of everyone. And especially during the pandemic, there was a lot going on um, that, you know, a force in terms of not accepting people for the way they were or the way they are. And I intend to do just the opposite, to be inclusive and to be accepting of people regardless of culture and, and, and differences. And one of the most important things is that relationship, making sure that I pronounce the student's name and preferred name in terms of being called correctly, making sure that I know what the pronouns are for that particular student or students, and making sure that I give respect and it, it works. I'm happy to tell you it makes a difference. Yeah, thank you, Richard. And um, I think on that note, uh, let's look at the next question that came in here is, what do you say about the problem of students who don't have the same access to the technology and equipment necessary for online education? What do you do at that point? And um, yeah, Albert or Al, go ahead. Okay, real quick, you know, yeah. we have um, technology deserts here in the district. Uh, in some community, it's really, really hard. I've had situations where students have had problems with their connections. Mm -hmm. I don't know, and I mentioned this to the university, I don't know why we don't have a conversation with Comcast or others where they can maybe go around certain neighborhoods with uh, the te technology that can boost the signals so that students can actually have the signals to be able to do work 
or either they create a place where students can come to the university and actually do their work. Even if it's an online class, they can literally come to the university. And I think at Cal, I think in, the, in one of the um, offices you have, I think there is that capability, but I don't know if it's, um, it seems like it's, it's, it's nice, but it may be limited to the number of the need that we have in the university. But clearly we do have that problem that one of the things I tried to do um, is I would, I, I know for my classes, my students do need their technology because my class is heavily blackboard oriented, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, I don't have a problem getting the laptops but I don't understand why this university can't create uh, classrooms, especially at the community college that actually has the technology. But the challenge is gonna be um, the online access. So, I mean, you guys share, please, some of your thoughts. Yeah, excellent. And just on that note, I see that Al and Christian, you've raised your hands. That's a great uh, tool. So for everyone else on the panel, if you do want to speak up, just raise that virtual hand so I can call you. Uh, just makes things run smoothly. And Christian, thank you. Yeah, we, we don't have those physical cues. We can't pass a mic around. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, um, no mic. But I really appreciate what, uh, what, what Al is saying there. When we think about a problem like this, I think we have to think both about what we can do in the classroom. We also have to give ourselves some grace here. These are structural issues. So in a situation where we say, hey, faculty, some students have internet, some don't, some have tools, some don't do great work, we, we have to know we're, we're not always going to be able to, to really do great work in that situation. So we do have to make sure that we're applying some pressure or joining in conversations about access to technology uh, because there, there are a lot of resources in the district, but saying to, to students who live on one side of the city, hey, just get up to Connecticut Ave and we have everything you need. For many students, that's a, that's a 60 to 90 minute trip uh, particularly if Metro is having a bad day, as it often is. So that's not really a reasonable suggestion for a lot of students. So within the class, we have, of course, we have lots of room for flexibility. We can let students do asynchronous work, watch recordings of classes if it's online. We can be more flexible in hybrid teaching. But I think overall, we have to encourage uh, each other uh, and the leadership of the university and our students to advocate for everyone in the district having what they need to succeed. And, and frankly, that's the ability to be online with high quality internet, full stop. Yes, I, I, I agree. Uh, I trust my students now more than ever. And I take the risk of sharing with them uh, my own personal cell phone number. And I make sure to encourage them only to text. And they do. I have not received a phone call when I've asked for text. And what that does is circumvent any issues of technology because I've yet to meet a student that doesn't have a cell phone mm -hmm. and doesn't use their cell phone, their particular number. And what that creates and has created is a back channel. I give students the opportunity to ask me questions and I have the ability to communicate with them directly on their cell phone in terms of assignments, in terms of guidance, in terms of rubrics, in terms of examples. And it's made a difference. Uh, if, if I make sure that all of the students have the information, the assignments, the due dates, the rubrics, all of the reasons behind the assignment, how it connects up with their careers, uh, there's no issue in terms of why a student would not have the assignment done. And I've yet to see a situation where a student, you know, is, is remiss in, in submitting the assignment. It works. And whether they have technology or not, it du duplicates, but it also can take the place of missing technology. And I wanted to share that with you. It, it works for me and it works for my students. And it gives us an opportunity to communicate in another way. Yeah, many of our students access courses we see with Blackboard through their tablets or their phones, right? So that's a huge tool that we have. Um, even right now, like using Mentimeter, for example, having your phone there really helps to keep that engagement going. So does anyone else want to add to this question before we move on to the next one? Uh, Peter? Put out on to your, your point there, David. Um, I think that we also have to remember as we move more and more back to on ground courses or some combination or hybrid uh, uh, situation, we can't allow ourselves to be complacent with the technology that we know the students do have. 
So Mentimeter is a great example of this using Menti in class. I mean, we know students are compelled. I mean, I, I am, I'm, I'm here looking at my other laptop and my phone, my, you know, my Bluetooth or whatever. We have the technology at our disposal and why not use it? So we have to challenge ourselves and our, our original paradigms that we come into the class with, I think, to say, how can we use that technology to our benefit? Like you have this super powerful phone on you, how could we make that part of the class so that it's not just bells and whistles, but that it's actually engaging? It doesn't always have to be the, the wired technology. It can be small things too. It, it can be a bit more uh, analog uh, type of technology as well, but making sure that, you know, I try to do this in my class. I only have about 10, 11 people and it's, it's, it's a mini uh, theater. And it, you know, it has maybe six rows. It's located in the business college. And because it's set up for lecture, I'm always thinking, what can I do just to get them moving and, and to facilitate some sort of a group kind of dynamic in a less than ideal room for this, this setup. So the, the small things that we can do on the phone are great. Uh, luckily, mm -hmm. it does have a smart board that um, flashes right to the screen, right when you're done your notes, it actually will flash up there. Uh, the, the QR code so students can take that with them or whatever. So not discouraging these small uses of technology and movement, even in our physical classes, I think is a big deal. Um, yeah, great point. Thank you, Peter. And Professor Spears, go ahead. Um, I don't know if you guys do this, but I never used to record my classes. And I started recording my classes. And even when I would do it, the first couple of virtual semesters, I noticed that nobody would look at the videos. But then when I started realizing I had students in class who were having technical difficulties and I would go back in to see who was watching the videos, those were the people who were watching the videos because they couldn't really get connected during class, but they would go back later when they had better connection and then watch them. And it was always the ones that were having technical difficulty. So I just want to throw that in there. Yeah, thank you, Professor Spears. And I think this is a good transition. I'll go ahead and mark this one as answered. Um, so. This one, how have you improved as an educator teaching through the pandemic? And what have we learned about ourselves, our students and our institution, community, et cetera, uh, during this time? So feel free to raise your hand. Uh, Christian, go ahead. Yeah, so I'll, I'll jump in. And I, I mm -hmm. think I'm gonna kind of second what Richard has been saying. I, I always feel like I, I trusted students earlier in my career, but I think the pandemic reminded me, uh, taught me how important it is to have a, a high level of trust in students and to make sure that you're beginning with that trust uh, right from the first day. Uh, and, and, you know, I think this works in a few different ways. I've changed a lot of policies around late penalties and grading and submission of work and, and things like that to just give students as much leeway as possible and make sure that no one's really being penalized because of things that might be beyond their control. And, and also that I'm not asking students to do that kind of performative thing where they need to come to me and tell me about, you know, a medical or personal problem they're having in order to earn the trust of submitting something uh, a week late, but instead just giving everyone that trust from the beginning uh, and, and, and working with it. And I think I've shared this with everyone here before. I, I really haven't seen any significant changes uh, in, in terms of, say, how much work I'm getting, how the quality of the work my ability to provide feedback in a timely fashion. It, it's all just the same as it was before, but there's more trust. The classroom atmosphere is better. There's more of a sense of community. And, and it's all really coming from just from the beginning, structuring a, a class in a way that says to students, I trust you, you're gonna do the work, you're gonna do it well. And so we're not gonna spend a bunch of time laying out policies. Uh, you're gonna have trust from the beginning. And if this were it to become a problem, we'd find a way to deal with it, but it, it hasn't been a problem yet. And I've been doing some version of this for a couple of years now. Yeah, thank you, Christian and Stella, go ahead. Yes, um, the pandemic, remember we were living with people dying, families losing their loved ones. So it forced us to, for me, to look at the mental health part of nursing. You know, we teach in nursing. And we're meant to be a caring profession. So really, students were scared, you know, coming to the profession where they cannot do the skills. We had to go to virtual simulation. And I have to commend the university in the sense of how much they invested in our students. You know, we couldn't go in person to do skills anymore. We, they gave us virtual simulation that students can actually do over and over at home. We have to change our policies to think, like we said, trust our students. 
believe in them, um, make them involved in the classroom more than we used to do before, you know, um, have them bring ideas that we can discuss in the classroom. I feel that the pandemic really helped us to see each other as living the human experience, just in different levels. Um, and because I work in the hospital with COVID, I, I, I was able to bring into my classroom a lot of experience on how these patients are feeling, how they are doing, and help our students see the importance of being in the profession. So it really did a lot to bring us together and kind of realize that we're all dealing with the same situations and we have to be understanding with our students. Yeah, definitely. Thank you, Stella. And Al, go ahead. Uh, yes. Um, one of the things I, I'm sort of responding, I, I think, to um, uh, in, in my texts uh, to some of the comments, but mm -hmm. I've had to grow a lot during the uh, pandemic. I've seen a lot in the pandemic. Uh, students have uh, uh, gotten COVID. Um, I've, I've, I've had experience uh, situations where people were really camped into their homes and it was like, you know, you're basically in prison. And I was literally in prison for a while. I mean, I was working 24 seven. If, if, if my uh, hours of working were like really logged, I would have exceeded all PUs but for, need for years, okay? Because that's all I was doing. I mean, um, but what I did learn was I learned some areas I had to grow. I learned some deficiencies that I had in terms of my approach to students. Um, it, so it taught me a lot about myself, but it also taught me how you have to be flexible with our students. Our students are different. And, um, and you know, and what's happened, you know, there's a lot of research out about the loss of education or, or attainment in, in high schoolers. We forget about the adults, you know? We forget about the fact that the adults were camped in their homes and they were basically watching TV and they weren't really reading, they weren't studying. These are the students we're getting, right? So everybody's had a loss. And so how do you deal with people who've been away from education or who've suffered a loss, who suffered trauma because they've got family members who've been sick and died? It really puts a lot on us. And so the goal is I try to teach in such a way that I, I try to gear my class for success. So what I try to do is, I, you know, is use something, you know, like progressive grading, where in the beginning, your classes are, um, are not as heavily weighted. Uh, and so students can sort of get, um, uh, you know, a higher grades. And then as the class progresses, it gets a little bit more challenging after they become familiar with you. By that time, students have really accumulated enough points for success. And then, you know, when they start really start doing the, the major work, it's almost guaranteed that if they do the work, they, they're going to learn, one, which is the most important thing, number two, they should pass the class. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. And Peter, go ahead. Um, yeah, these are all wonderful points, so I don't need to say too much, but um, Tracy Addy uh, does a wonderful job with, uh, there's a form, it's called the Who's in Class form, and we looked a little bit at that at one of our PDs, and she has a great quote about uh, diversity when you're thinking about inclusive teaching and, and what it is, what it isn't, and maybe just sort of an overall summary of the ideas for us to think about. So she, she talks about inclusive teacher, uh, teaching being responsive to the diversity of the people who are in your class and just designing learning environments that include all students, that simple. And the question then next for me always is so that I can be better is, how do I get that information? And her work is centered on just that. It's about developing a, a who's in class form. And this is a big movement in PD right now across the country, right? So if we wanna be responsive, inclusive, and consider all kinds of diversity, whether it's neurodiversity or what have you, how would we find out unless we're actually asking our students or coming up with some sort of a, a whether an informal or institutional a survey form that we do on the first day that hopefully uh, includes that voice right on the first day and, and awares us of what situations our students may have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis so that we can do that work of, of adjusting and, you know, challenging myself not to just make it a first day thing do it on the midterm. Obviously, we get feedback at the end of the term. Uh, if you haven't done a mid-semester feedback form, some people in the, in the room with me now, uh, we've done a lot of work around that area. Uh, these are voluntary kind of setups that you can do. You can have one of us come to your class and get that data for you about, you know, hey, what is a student saying at the midpoint? Am I doing a great job? Is there something I could be doing a little bit better? 
and then we can make again that adjustment. Um, I'm challenging myself to do it uh, in every class, have some kind of a formative assessment uh, in the class before I leave to get data back from my students. And we covered this in AQ too, like what these muddy points, right? These sticky points, what, what's not landing well and what may have I not considered when I asked this question so that I can do it better next time. I think those things all help us on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, thank you, Peter. And Richard? Uh, yes, I, I agree that students uh, feel, have felt and continue to feel a sense of isolation. Uh, my students are in early childhood education programs. Uh, they're almost all female. And under the circumstances, they have families of their own. Uh, they and their spouses or partners are working multiple jobs. And yet they're still attending class. And they are intentionally there because they know it's the future. And in order to engage those students to help enhance their mental health to eliminate a lot of that sense of insecurity and isolation, we discuss, we talk. Uh, we don't just, you know, uh, go over content. The content is important to cover the scope and sequence of, of the material, clearly. But what we do is we share. Uh, we, we share information, we, we share experiences and feedback, we discuss common issues. And I ask the students, you know, has this been, you know, important to you? Uh, what, what have you gotten out of it? What, what does this mean to you? And almost always, I see feedback saying, oh, it means so much to be able to, to share my concerns and my issue in my program with someone else, not even from my country, who I just met. We have students from all kinds of countries that have come to Washington, D.C. in search of uh, a better life. And um, a lot of the students make friends through the class and through that learning community. Uh, so my positive expectations uh, tend to be transmitted to my students, and they seem to respond positively that this is a, a safe haven. It's a, a way of, of, of creating some space for, for ourselves in terms of discussing issues that pertain to the course, that relate to us as professionals, and that help us in terms of building our own resilience in the face of the pandemic and, and its aftermath. Yeah, thank you, Richard. And I think that's a really natural segue to our next question is, how do you feel about your comfort level with the various online platforms or apps you have utilized now compared to when you first used them? And I actually want to add a second part to this is, how did you get your students to be more comfortable with these apps and learning online as well? Were there any strategies that you used? And Stella, go ahead. Yes, is, is the intention of it and how you how you sell it to them, um, you know. In the you know, being a mother of four children, children, children will always ask you why, why, mommy, why, why, and we are dealing with adults here, so sometimes we miss that piece of explaining why it's important. But if the student catches fire and understands why you are doing what you're doing, they are more willing to follow through. So, for example, in my course, I teach nursing fundamentals. On the online version, I was not good online at all. And I was very honest with my students. Listen, guys, I need help. And I'll tell them, I'm teaching this. I know the content, but I need your help with the technology. Okay, and they are good with technology. So it's a good marriage right there. So first of all was how to use a whiteboard. A student taught me that. Of course, I, I, I get to Peter. Peter discussed about the Mentimeter and all these other things. Then another one that I, I was very happy to know how to use was... Um, what do they call it? When you make your teams, put them in um oh, the breakout rooms. Breakout sessions. Oh yeah. my mm -hmm. goodness. Mm -hmm. Breakout rooms. That was great because you could not put them in little groups and come in and out of the groups and see their conversations. I mean, and I celebrated every little step of these milestones. I call them milestones for me because I I didn't know them before. So that was a blessing of the online. And, and even as I as I've gone back to class now in person, I try to utilize those things too because. It's the students like it. They can get on their on their phone. They can 
pull up things on their phone so fast that more than I can do. But it's been uh, awesome. So that's a good thing I've, I can take from the pandemic, being able to use technology in a more efficient way and in being intentional about what we're doing and why. Thank you. And speaking on that, um, Professor Yarish told me that what she would do in her breakout rooms is breakout rooms of one, right? So if you have an activity where you want each student to work by themselves and you're not in the same shared space or sh uh, virtual room, you make breakout rooms with one person in each room, right? So that's a, another strategy you can use uh, for teaching online, which I thought was great. I didn't even think about that. Uh, Christian, go ahead. Yeah, David, as you mentioned that, it makes me think of uh, something I started doing with Google Docs. So mm -hmm. in smaller breakouts, uh, if you're online, you're not really able to monitor what's happening. Now, I don't mean monitor in like the panopticon kind of way, but you just don't know, are students done? Are they stuck? Unless you're mm -hmm. moving from room to room. So I found it really helpful to assign something in, in one of the Google platforms. Uh, and then I could look at the two or three Google Docs and I could see, oh man, there, there's nothing moving in this document. Are they thinking? Maybe there's a problem. And then I could jump into a breakout room. But Stella, what you were saying made me think, and I, I put together a list. I was thinking back pre-pandemic. You mentioned being really intentional. And that was something I always struggled with. Uh, pre-pandemic, I was bouncing back and forth for a class engagement app between Poll Everywhere, Mentimeter, Nearpod, Socrative, sometimes Kahoot, Class Dojo, and then Google stuff. And every time uh, Peter applauded or someone else would say, hey, here's a new app that just came out, I'd watch the video and there'd be some ed tech consultant uh, no offense to anyone in Cal saying this solves everything. And so I'd switch everything over to that because it was so cool. And then I'd use it. And then the next semester, they'd be like, wait, wait, wait. If you like Mentimeter, we have Mentimetro. And I'd switch it over to that. And at a certain point, I, I realized I had to really pause and think before I try any new technology. Is this fulfilling a specific educational need? And is it doing it in, in a better or different way than what I'm already using? And to me, what it's come down to is like, you know, if I have stuff designed in Nearpod and I've used that in a course before, I'm much more likely to update what I have to make it more engaging or helpful to fill in some gaps than to say, ooh, I'm using Mentimeter in this other class and that works well. So it's, it's more for me, is it filling a gap and is it something that I can sustain or is this gonna be a lot of work for me for a, a limited payoff? That's such a, you know what, I, that's, those are great points. And I've been a lot more intentional about the apps that I recommend, because I know like simplicity is key here. And especially when you are teaching online, I never want faculty members to feel overwhelmed or go from zero to 100. Use what you know first. Um, I can also talk about Microsoft 365, right? You talked about Google Docs, but yeah, I've heard professors using OneNote or just a shared Word document, right? That you can put in Blackboard, put that link and they can also collaborate on that. But yes, being intentional about the apps that you're using is really key here, right? Uh, Al, go ahead. Uh, yes, for me, again, I'm sharing my generational difference with my colleagues. Uh, I don't like to use gimmicks because I find mm -hmm. that students uh, will see these as a little gimmicky. I also, uh, but I, what I do is I use a, a few of the online apps, but I do something very basic. It's like, I will break them in groups. Uh, what I often do is I will ask a business question. I will say, you know, uh, what is international business and why is it important? I, I'll, I'll create different questions for different groups. I'll let them talk about it. Then I bring them back to the, the larger group and they share something very simple, something not complex. Now, this doesn't mean that I, I don't use Yahoot. I do, but I'm, I, here's what I found. You have to use Yahoot sparingly because mm -hmm. if you use it too often, it becomes gimmicky. Okay, and, uh, and some of the other tools, you just have to sort of be intentional, but balance how you use it. I prefer sort of the, the you know, using my Blackboard, for example, I will share with them a video on YouTube. The purpose of the video will be, you talk about it in your groups, you come back out, real simple, come back out to the larger group and we have a conversation. What I also do is I try to avoid long-winded um, uh, lectures because I find that they start sleeping <laughs> after about uh, 20 minutes. So the goal has to be, you, you require that they read, you, you share something and then you engage them and you start at, and I call them out on questions and nothing that they say is wrong. It, it, it'll be, oh, well, that's a good point you made, but did you think about this? Did you think about you know, a bill of lading? Did you think about you know, those kinds of things? Did you think about 
uh, you know, the fact that Americans are perceived as ethnocentric. You know, those are the kinds of questions I get them to kind of talk about uh, because I have an international group of students and they all think Americans are ethnocentric. The only people who don't think <laughs> Americans are ethnocentric are Americans, right? And so I, I get to have this whole rich discussion, um, which sort of helps the class. But anyway, let me be quiet and let others speak. Yeah, all great point. And you know, here, let's just do a temperature check of the room. Uh, if you can give me a thumbs up, you know, with that emoji on your Zoom toolbar, or if you're on camera, give me a thumbs up. You know, even just those quick checks, uh, that really helps, right? And it just kind of, everyone's paying attention and everyone's on the call, right? So I love that. Um, and Richard, go ahead. Yes, I'll, I'll put my thumbs up down and uh, thank you. I, I appreciate it. I wanted to reinforce uh, what uh, professors have said. Um, using technology is important, but I, I like to take advantage of the richness of the technology. Uh, I, like you, I, I use the chat feature um, to also engage students and to have a conversation going on in addition uh, to what is happening in the virtual classroom face-to-face. -face. Uh, I find that that also helps, especially with regard to cultural differences among our, my students. I have students from various countries and various countries have different child, uh, childhood education practices. And the representatives who come from those countries of origin are very uh, vocal about the value of the child care practices in their countries. And it makes for a very rich discussion on chat and elsewhere. You know, whatever works in terms of uh, raising children and helping them grow and develop. So the chat function works. I, I love the emojis. And I make sure at the beginning of, of our course to give guidelines in terms of what is acceptable practice and what is not. Uh, one of the things that I will not tolerate in class is uh, any kind of disrespect in whatever form it involves. So I monitor the chat while I'm listening to the conversation going on. And I will also insist that students uh, raise their hand if they want to be heard. And we follow those low-tech procedures to assure that the high-tech elements, you know, function uh, on and for the benefit and on behalf of everyone in the class. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Richard. And our next question is: How do we make up for the lack of informal conversation times? You know, where we get to know each other with students in our live classes. Well, I, I wanted to jump in uh, briefly and say that I opened my class ahead of time and I encouraged students to be there ahead of time. And as far as I'm concerned, that makes a difference. Uh, many students will look forward to being there ahead of time. And even if it's 10 or 15 minutes, I greet the students. I ask how they're doing, how their families are. I make notes in terms of the size of the families, the names of the people in the families, um, what, what their program uh, is in terms of work. Um, and I take the temperature, but I also make sure that the students know that they are fully received. I intend to receive them and embrace them in terms of, of the enterprise we're involved together. And they respond positively. And um, when I smile, they smile as well so that you know, there's, there's no fear in my classroom. I want to take fear out of it. And I don't think fear belongs in any of our classrooms because there's too much on the outside. And I try as much as possible to nurture and preserve that safe space that we're in, that protected classroom, that, that laboratory, so to speak. Yeah, thank you, Richard. Christian, anything to add? Yeah, I have to give props to our social work colleagues. Uh, early in the pandemic, uh, Natalie Mizell and I can't remember, it might have been Lisa Secret, but anyway, so someone else with her in social work were 
uh, talking about some of the trauma students were experiencing. And they said, basically, hey, we're going to do some sort of warm up, some sort of check in at the beginning. And a lot of the our, our response, I think, is faculty there were kind of like, man, with all that we have to cover, can we can we do that? <laughs> but I thought in, in writing, we often do writing warm ups. So I just kind of put them together. So the beginning <laughs> of every class now, we do a quick little warm up, uh, see how people are feeling. It can be as simple as how are you doing today, one to 10 in the chat, and then tell me, you know, what what music you're listening to today. It takes two to three minutes to do. Everyone can respond. If there's something you need to address or want to address, you can take a few more minutes to have a conversation. But from what I hear from students, uh, this has been a big, a big uh, sustaining thing for them in these classes that no matter what, even if they're feeling completely out of it and terrible and they're not really gonna participate that day because they're just not in a good place, they're able to say at the beginning, for uh, the roots, thank you for checking in with me. Now I need to go back into my shell for a while, but I will talk to you after <laughs> class. And, and that makes a big difference. Richard's talking about not having fear. I, I think some of the fears of being judged or being seen to be less than because you can't really bring your full self and do everything you want to do on a particular day. So something small like that can, can help make sure students you know, feel seen. Yeah, Christian, when you talk about music, one of the best tips I learned during the pandemic is since we're doing everything online, you know, that kind of awkward silence at the beginning. So if you play some music or even show a YouTube video or have a student be a DJ for even that like little buffer time when class begins, that's a really way to like just make everything really comfortable, calm. You can talk about the music. <laughs> they also get to know you a little bit more, right? Your music taste and music styles and it humanizes you as a professor as well, right? Uh, Peter. Absolutely, yeah. Um, it's, it's Professor stealing Lyrical. Out, stealing out of my playbook. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, while we're on the topic, um, I am an introvert. Uh, I don't actually enjoy talking to people. <laughs> um, I have worked to get better at that over a lot of time, and I have a very outward-facing life career. Obviously, as you mentioned, you know, rap, I rap. I teach, I do professional development. So you have to be outward facing, but it's not my natural disposition. Um, left to my druthers, if I had a class and somebody said, hey, with this question, and by the way, I, I made this question. Uh, <laughs> um, I made this from the standpoint of, I don't want to talk to you. That's actually true. Like when I'm in a class, I don't want to engage. Um, at least the, the little eight-year-old in me doesn't want to engage. This version of me, yes, I'm very capable and able to do it, but truthfully i'd rather be reading i'd rather be writing i'd rather be working on a rap <laughs> i'd rather um i'd rather not be it's just how i'm wired and i think this goes back to my other answer too it's like we do have to be aware of who's in the classroom and that's part of the conversation hey you might want to ask do you guys consider yourself introverts extroverts ambiverts you may be thinking you're doing them a great favor by having this great discussion time and i've been in some amazing classes that we have here especially at the community college where the discussion led um, this stage in my life, I'm very comfortable in a discussion-led class. However, there would have been a time for me that that would have been trauma. <laughs> so I would have been like, anything but speaking, please. Thank you. You know, and so it really helps when we develop uh, just these, the, the other piece that I was getting at with this question is the informal piece. Like, hey, just stopping by somebody's office when it's one-on-one -on -one, as opposed to, you know, 20 on one or whatever. For some students, I get it. That's terrifying as well, too. But when we know who we're dealing with, we can pull them over on the side a little bit easier. And, and then we know we're not setting them up for failure, too. And we can have those hall conversations, uh, you know, but how do we replicate those online is a trick. Um, I think one tactic that I shared with our group before, and again, this was stolen from some of the best people at AQ, <laughs> was just doing this, you know, when you start out with your class, say, hey, we're going to walk you guys along my house. We're going to take you on a little tour, show you where I actually am, because I really feel like we're invading in their privacy. And again, when I'm home, I, I can't wait to get home to my little tiny office and do my work. I could be up there all day. 15 hours could go by. I'm in, it's bliss for me. But if we don't sort of welcome them into our home, I don't think we're ever can fairly expect to have them do the same with us and feel like, hey, you know, I'm sharing my screen now. I'm comfortable until we break down a lot of these artificial walls. And sometimes I've made headway. I'll wrap it up here with my students by just admitting right out the gate. I'm an introvert. 
I may not look like your classic version of it, but is anybody else? And then I kind of know right away. And they're like, oh, I identify with him. He's an introvert. He probably likes X, Y, and Z. And they're right. You know, and then we have something to bond over the kind of things that introverts would or extroverts or what have you, depending on your style. Yeah, great points there, Peter. Thank you. Al, go ahead. Uh, yes, I create informal discussions. My office hours start uh, 30 minutes before my class. So mm -hmm. students will sometimes just pop in and I've learned about students. I've got a number of students that are single moms. I mean, you know, they'll, they'll just chat, and just share. Uh, I even have learned some commonalities I've, I have with some students. The other thing I think it's intentional, what I try to do uh, during class is I'll so, sometimes get in a diatribe, right? You know, where I'm, I'm, I'm lowering the discussion and I'm asking them to discuss other things around business because business is very broad, right? And so that way, the, it, it, the discussion gets stop getting so heavy, but it then starts getting them to relax and, and talk about it. Um, but there are students that are going to be nervous with other students. And I think one of the things I, I try to do is I always like to rotate my groups and we're rotating the groups because what happens is once they become friends, those are the groups they want to self-select in. Now, I, do, I will let them self-select for certain assignments. But what I try to do is just mix it up because what used to frustrate me is there are students who have actually gone through an entire three-year, two-year, three-year program at the community college, and they've been with other students. They don't even know these students. They're, you know, they, they've not taken the time to get to know them. So I'm trying to kind of create opportunities where they actually are. But I'm comfortable with my students talking about almost general things because I can always create a business nexus. You know, it, it, anything they say, I can tell them, oh, you can have a gig doing that. You know, so it, it creates that that kind of opportunity. But I do think we have to be intentional and we do need to have those, quote unquote, informal uh, conversations. And we just got to work it in uh, the class. Thanks. Excellent. And uh, Stella, go ahead. Yes. So so we have to work it in in class. I know sometimes out of class. It all depends. Mm -hmm. I want to give an example to um, to clarify this you know where, where we are in the online version you know it, it's good to see each other but like we said there are times the students are, are not visible you don't see them so you don't have you don't know if they're getting it or if they're if you said something that is bad or what have you so I remember one time I like to make corrections right away and sometimes sometimes I I, I feel like I might say it in with with, with a level of um what I say tone that might be not good the student might not like it so I always want to run it by them and make sure it's fine. So I had a student one time, I asked her a question. Um, she couldn't answer it. And um, I, I kept asking her follow-up questions, you know, and I think I went a little too far in asking too many follow-up questions. First of all, she, she clearly did not know the answer. So right after that, she logged off. I'm like, I, and my conscience was like, oh my God, I must have said something wrong to her now. She's logged off. So thank God the les lectures are, are being, uh, um, is, is recorded. But at the same time, I felt like, well, maybe I, I was too hard the way I talked to her. Yeah, and everybody's listening. You know, what Peter is saying about an introvert and you keep probing them, they might feel more uh, very ashamed. So right after class, it, it will not, my, my conscience will not rest. I called her. I said, did I say something wrong? I noticed that right after I made, I asked you questions, you left the classroom. So professor, no, 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 that was not the reason. I left the classroom because my internet was not working. That's why I left the class. That, that's not the reason. But just being intentional, that's a word we've been using over and over, clarify things. Sometimes we think we're doing them a favor, but we are hurting them. But if we're not taking time to circle through the conversation, okay, did I say something wrong? If I did, I'm sorry, let's move on. If you leave things to linger, I found, it begins a small problem begins it begins becomes a big mountain because we're not dealing with things and sometimes as professors we might mean well but we might not have the right presentation you need to address it ask them did i say something wrong if i did you can approach me at this time maybe not during class let's talk about it later but give them instructions on how we can make sure we're on the same page because again being in, being in, if i'm in the classroom i can tell if you're upset i can tell if what I said did not hit the right chord, but in the online version, we have to be a, do a little more work to clarify things before it begins. It becomes a big problem. 
Excellent, Stella. And you know what? This this has been such an engaging discussion. I can't believe it's almost done. So just to wind down, we have a couple more minutes. I did put one more question on the screen, and I would like to hear from all of you on the panel, maybe in one or two sentences, like your final thoughts. What would you do over if you could do it again? In other, hopefully we don't have to do the pandemic again, but in other words, how have we adapted and what mistakes have we made and learned from? Um, so Christian, if you'd like to start one or two sentences and we can go around. Sure, sure. So I think I've, I've learned about the phrase toxic rigor and I've learned to see it around me in academic spaces a, a bit more. And if I could go back, uh, I will just make sure early on that whatever the pressures may be out there in the academic world, I wasn't creating difficult situations for students purely for the sake of, of making something feel more rigorous and that I was really focused in on specific learning goals and specific community building goals and just let things go from there. Excellent. Who would like to go next? Yes, I, I'd like to go. Uh, I, I am more mindful than ever of the warning to, to do no harm. And I make sure that before I speak, I ask myself, you know, is what I'm going to say and what I'm saying, is it fair to everyone? Uh, is it helpful? Will it make a difference? And make sure that I keep in mind the need for alternative assessments, alternative assignments. Students learn differently. And it's more important than ever to accommodate those differences. Excellent. Thank you, Richard. Uh, Peter, would you like to go next? Yeah, it's very similar to uh, Christians, um, especially in math. I, I think we do this a lot and I catch myself uh, doing it all the time just because I've been indoctrinated into it. Um, I'm no longer going to ask questions that do not relate to the class just because I think you're going to need it at some point in life. Uh, uh, stopping the, this is a great life lesson kind of thing that, that you need um, when I really have no idea. Um, and in math, we, we tend to do this thing where we say, oh, you're going to need that in your next class. Worry about this class. Worry about what you said you're going to do in the class. Of course, things are going to come up, and that's fine as they naturally progress. But I'm not going to be the one to say, you might need this other thing down the street, uh, and it might happen in two or three years. Because, again, I have difficulty relating that back to the student learning outcomes of the class. Thank you, Peter. Uh, Stella, would you like to go next? Yes. Um, <laughs> learns how to be flexible. Um, I like what my colleagues have said about making the environment not toxic. Let your students look forward to coming to class. It, it is, it's bad enough we're dealing with the pandemic or whatever we were dealing with at the time, but make your class something that they look forward to being in because of how you address them, knowing that you're flexible, that you're reachable, and that you are willing to talk through the situations and make them realize that there's no, as far as you're still on this side of the earth, we can figure this out. You know, it's, it's, there's a future. We're trying to learn. Learning is a focus and not deadlines. Learning is a focus. That's what I've learned. Excellent. Stephanie. I agree with the being flexible. Um, and just if I could do it over again, I, I teach a lot, I teach fashion classes and I have a lot of hands-on classes and certain things like sewing was like impossible to teach online, but sewing has been taught online before. So just finding better platforms or better resources for my students, instead of just thinking they couldn't do it and it wasn't possible. Yeah. Rosette, Professor Beck. <laughs> I can't hear you. Oh, can you hear me now? Yeah, there you go. Okay. Um, I've learned to be more personable. <laughs> um, just from listening to uh, Dr. Peter saying how he showed his home off, you know, I'm letting them see, hey, here's my environment. And from him saying he's, he's an introvert, because believe it or not, I know I like to play a lot, but I'm actually shy and I'm an introvert too, and it made me feel like it's okay to be that. And the other thing that I, that I really um, appreciate was from um, Dr. Uh, Pearsall. Um, when the students ask a question, it's still positive, even though it wasn't quite the answer that you were looking for, um, you just build on it. 
So I've learned um, those two uh, pointers today, and I feel like it'd be very helpful with my growth um, as an instructor here. Thank you very much. And last but not least, Al. Uh, one of the things I've learned is uh, I had to understand what rigor was. Um, one of the things is I used to, my, my, if you see my Blackboard site, I have to cover it up because it's intimidating to students, right? And I put everything in Blackboard. And one of the things I learned was, I thought this was good because students would go to the university and say, hey, professor, you know, uh, a lot of the professors up there are just like you. And I said, well, that's the way we are in business. But in reality, that's, it, it wasn't right. It, it's, it, and I had to learn that, tone down your work. Because what you think is all this busy work, it's not really helping students. It's putting fear in them. It's, 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 so what I had to do is I had to create my course where it, I only really had one, like each week, um, they would review the text, they would look at the PowerPoint and maybe they would have a discussion board. But then a lot of the other activity took place in class. And I, and I had to understand what, that rigor is not busy work. Rigor is just making sure that they learn the subject so it doesn't mean that it has to be super intense. Uh, it just means that learning actually happens. So that's something that I've, I've, I've be, I began to start growing in terms of doing, not making my course extra hard, extra tough, thinking that somehow that makes me a better professor. Actually, it made me a worse professor. And so I'm paring it down, giving them ex experiential experience. I, I'll have guests come in that are actual business people that are actually discussing things with them. So. The goal is for them to actually learn, and, and, and I, don't, I didn't want to use toxic because that would be giving Professor Aguilar too much credit, and uh, <laughs> I would hate to categorize my work that way. However, <laughs> the level of rigor in my class used to be, and even now, still has to go through evaluation. Okay, thank you. I mean, I wish I could sign up for all of your courses, right, and be a student again. I, I miss that time. But thank you, everyone, so much for being on this call. I have learned so much from the discussion. It's very fruitful. I mean, we could do this for hours, right, all day. Uh, so we'd love to have a future session, right, as well. But I think the theme of today is really being an in intentional about what we do, but also flexible. And I think we've all become more patient mm -hmm. also yeah. with this process and more understanding of our students and each other as well right so thank you so much peter for putting this together um and working with thank everyone you. here thanks for all your work of course thank you and i would love to meet with you all again in the future i'll be back at the community college on the 15th um so i'll say hello but thank you so much everyone for coming here today i hope you have a great rest of your week and we will see you very soon awesome. thanks, thanks so much all right thank you. Thanks. Bye. Yeah, thank you for the invitation thank see you, you.